Imagine yourself in five or ten years' time and your ideal life. And then think about what you can do right now to make that happen. Don't wait for five or ten years. Start doing things now that mean that that will be a reality. Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast dedicated to helping you reinvent your career. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to overcome the challenges of making changes to your career so you can do more meaningful work and enjoy your professional life. In each episode, I feature people who have decided to step off the beaten path to reinvent their careers and do work that matters. We talk through their unique personal stories, the challenges they overcame, and the lessons they learned along the way to help you understand what it takes to relaunch your own career. Today, my guest is going to share her story of relaunching her career as an investment banker to become a nutritionist after being diagnosed with bowel cancer. We'll discuss investing your time in only those things that matter and treating each day as if it's your last. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel, I'll share the steps I'm trying to take to create the future I desire. Today, I'm speaking with Caroline Yates, who started her professional life in investment banking after graduating with a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Oxford. After five years, she joined one of her banking clients, Extrata Mining, as an investor relations manager. Following the company's takeover, she was a founding member of a new mining venture, X2 Resources, but a serious medical issue led her to leave her corporate life behind to pursue a career as a nutritionist. She's currently completing her studies while writing three books, caring for her toddler, and undergoing treatment for incurable stage four bowel cancer. Now, today's episode is going to be a bit longer than most of our other episodes. Normally, we spend a lot of time in post-production editing these conversations down to make them as concise as possible for busy listeners like you. But we decided to leave the majority of my conversation with Caroline in unedited because we thought it was just the best way to do justice to her brave story. The week we had planned to record this conversation, Caroline actually had to have a sudden emergency heart surgery, but she very generously insisted on still doing this recording, which just gives you a glimpse into her positive attitudes about life and work. We're going to get into some very personal details related to Caroline's health today. So Caroline, if you're listening to this, I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time and energy amidst everything you have going on to share your personal story with me and the Career Relaunch listener community around the world. You can get all the show notes from today's episode at careerrelaunch.net slash 62. Caroline spoke with me from London, England. Good morning, Caroline, and thank you so much for coming on to Career Relaunch. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Excited to take part. Great. Well, there are so many things I want to talk with you about today, Caroline, and I just want to start by saying I really don't feel like we can do justice to everything you've been through in a half-hour conversation, but I'm going to try, and I'm hoping <laughs> to talk about your decision to leave the world of banking behind and also the impact your health has had on your career decisions and outlook on life. Can you just start by sharing a glimpse into what's been happening in your life even over the past week, because especially as it relates to your health, I understand you've just come out of an emergency heart operation. I have indeed. Yeah, we didn't know if we'd be able to record this because right. uh, two days ago I was still in hospital having been admitted to A&E on Thursday with them. Um, fluid around my heart, which had to be drained in an emergency. But perhaps, perhaps take a step back from that. So last year, I was diagnosed with stage four bowel cancer. That means it's spread to various places in my body. My prognosis is poor, if I'm honest. Uh, it's an incurable condition. Although I am having treatment, I've been through the works of surgery, radiotherapy. I'm on chemotherapy fortnightly, and I'm responding well to it. So that's kind of where I am right now. And I think it's, it's important to get that out up front because it has influenced a lot of my career decisions over the past few years. But perhaps to step back a little bit further and give you um, a very brief history of, of me, I am an Oxford graduate, studied philosophy, politics and economics and took the typical route of going into the city and starting work in investment banking. And this was 13 years ago now. I went to Deutsche Bank, 
and spent five years there. And, and it was a fantastic career as a, an early 20 something. I learned a huge amount. I worked with incredible people, both within the bank and on the client side. I was in a client facing role in corporate broking. So I got to spend a lot of time with big companies and CEOs and CFOs, which was just amazing, really, as you know, somebody starting out with their career. But it was something that I knew that I wouldn't want to do forever. It was very intense. It was very long hours. Uh, I didn't have much of a life. So after five years, I actually moved to one of my clients, a mining company called Extrata. It was a very big company at the time and spent a few years with them. They were then taken over and I stayed with the CEO and CFO of that company. We set up a new mining company, which was sort of private equity back we raised a big fund to, to go out and buy mining assets. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Then everything kicked off with my health. And three years ago, I decided to leave the city world altogether and started training as a nutritional therapist. So that's where I am at the moment. So I definitely want to talk more about each of those two pivots in your career. Before we do that, you alluded to the cancer for those listeners who aren't familiar with the various stages of cancer, what exactly is stage four bowel cancer, also known as secondary or metastatic colorectal cancer? Stage four, as you rightly said, is also metastatic cancer. It just means that the cancer has spread from its original location into other organs. So for me, I have cancer that began in the bowel. I had a number of polyps, which are small growths, uh, found in my colon, which is the lower part of your bowel, three years ago. And that was kind of the start of my cancer journey. At the time, we thought that they were only precancerous. It turns out that was probably not the case, unfortunately. So I had a couple of small operations, but was otherwise considered fine until last year when I started suffering from a bad back, which, to cut a very long story short, turned out to be a tumor in my spine. And when I had various scans, it was also discovered that I had cancer in my lungs, my liver, my pelvis, and in various lymph nodes. So what had started in my bowel, and they could discover that through biopsies and through tests of, of the tumor cells, had spread to various places. And that's what made it stage four. Interestingly, I don't have any tumors in my bowel, uh, which stumps everybody, but it, uh, it's just one of the... Uh, Examples of how strange a disease cancer is, I'm afraid. I know that prognosis is a really funny word because nothing is definitive when it comes to cancer, uh, but can you share what the prognosis is here for you, especially as it relates to your stage four bowel cancer, or at least what you've been told? So the prognosis for stage four bowel cancer is very poor. Five-year survival rates are well under 10%. But there's a couple of things to say about that. You've already alluded to it. But prognosis is, it's an odd thing because all the doctors can do is look at averages. And there is nothing average about my situation, to be honest. The majority of bowel cancer patients are over 70. So you have to kind of think that when you're over 70, your life expectancy is not hugely long anyway. And so being young is a positive for the start. Secondly, everybody just responds so differently to treatment. Like we didn't know whether chemotherapy was going to work for me, but actually it's working superbly. And at my last scan, all bar one of my tumors had shrunk. If treatment hadn't worked, my life expectancy last year was six to 12 months. But it's kind of irrelevant because treatment is working. And so it's very much now how long is a piece of string? And my view is, I feel well most of the time. Chemo is very hard, but between chemo, I feel very well. So I just live life for today and none of us know what's around the corner. So I try my best not to focus on what might happen, but just to focus on what I can control and what I can do today. You mentioned that the majority of people who have this are in their 70s. We should point out that you're actually in your early 30s. 
Yep, that's right. Yeah, I'm 34. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to come back to this, Caroline, and I'd like to get into more detail about your cancer and how it's affected your career perspectives. But I would like to start by talking about your career journey, which is the focus of this show. And (laughs) you haven't always been a nutritionist. You did allude to the time you were at Deutsche Bank as an investment banker. Can we go back to that time? And can you just explain what you used to do during your days as an associate at Deutsche Bank? And we'll move forward from there. So I started Deutsche Bank straight out of university. I did an internship and then I went on to the graduate program, starting as an analyst and then in time was promoted to associate. I worked in a division called Corporate Roking, which is equity advisory for UK corporates specifically. We used to have set clients with an an ongoing relationship and we would help them with anything to do with the equity market. So it would be everything from investor roadshows and results to transactions. So if they were doing a merger, if they were doing equity issue, we would be involved in the sort of investor market facing side of that. So it was a very hands-on client facing role. We worked closely with the mergers and acquisitions and the equity capital markets teams and and the debt side as well. And as an analyst and associate, I mean, you spend a lot of your time (laughs) writing pitch books. Um, But Uh but I was lucky that I could go to a lot of client meetings as well. I used to go on investor roadshows. So I I had a lot of face-to-face time with the clients, which was always for me was very much the enjoyable part. I know that investment banking has got to be at least traditionally seen as one of the most premier high profile industries out there, which I know attracts a lot of people to the industry. After about five years, you mentioned you decided to leave. What made you want to leave that industry behind? It certainly had a reputation as one of the best industries to get into. So out of university, it's what everybody was rushing to do. The salary, starting salary was good. You know, it was glamorous and exciting to a lot of extent, but it is very hard work. I mean, my my hours were very, very long. I was in at 7.30 in the morning because we got in before markets opened. And I frequently worked until kind of 11, 12 o'clock at night. And it's hard. It's hard to have a life when you're doing that all the time. You physically and emotionally, you burn out. You don't get to see your friends very much. Uh, I was constantly having to cancel things. I found it very hard to date. And, you know, all of these things add up. And and for me, although I did enjoy the work a lot, and I I would actually go and do it again. I wouldn't change how I started my career. But I always knew that that the time would come when I wanted to leave and do something that was a bit more flexible, a bit more sustainable. Then one of my clients, Extrata, approached me and they were looking for a new investor relations manager, which essentially was the internal version of my role at the bank. So I knew the role very, very well. I knew the person who was doing it. I got on with him very well. It was a company I absolutely loved. I had a huge amount of respect for the team there. It was a very young company. It had grown from very little, very fast. They were constantly doing transactions, mergers, acquisitions, raising equity, buying new mines, big projects. It was a very global business. And so I jumped at the chance when they approached me and and asked if I was interested in joining the company. Was that a difficult decision for you to leave behind the, at least uh, on the surface, the, the perceived, the more glamorous world of eye banking to focus much more on investor relations? What was hard about that? There were definitely challenges involved in leaving. I think the harder thing for me was making the decision that now is the time to leave. And I had actually already made that decision when Extrata approached me. And, and the fact that they approached me and they came up with this very attractive role, which it was well paid, there was a lot of global travel, there was there was different perks to investment banking, made it much, much easier, actually. I think I'd been struggling to work out if I left investment banking, what I was going to do. And, and as you said, I'd, there was a, definitely a reticence in taking a potentially a salary cut or doing something that was was maybe more mundane. Um, so I was really lucky that I didn't have to do that. I didn't take a salary cut and I was doing something that actually day to day I found even more exciting than I had found investment banking. So you're there at Extrata. It sounds like things are going really well for you. It seems like you enjoyed the work. What happened? Not that long after I joined, it was two years after I joined, Extrata were bought out by their majority shareholder, a company called Glencore. There was an option to to go to Glencore. I would have had to move to Switzerland, which I was 
totally open to doing. Uh, and I definitely considered staying on with the new company. But the CEO and CFO decided they weren't going to. The, it had started as a merger and then it became increasingly hostile as it went on. Um, so they decided they wanted to make a move and they asked me to join them to set up their new venture, which was then called X2 Resources. I mean, one of the reasons I'd moved to Extrata was because I liked the team and I absolutely jumped at the chance. I got on very well with the CEO. I found him to be an exceptional individual, very entrepreneurial, very forward thinking. And I was really excited by the, the chance to stay and work with that team and do something of our own. I felt like I had no reason not to. I had no ties. I didn't have a family at the time. And this was just an opportunity that was only ever going to come along once in a lifetime. So I, so I jumped at it. It was amazing. I mean, I learned how to build a business very, very fast. There were six of us in the end. Uh, the others were all very senior people from Extrata. We raised over $5 billion, which was a phenomenal amount of money. The challenges then came because unfortunately, the market didn't go the way we thought. We thought we were at the bottom and we were going to be be able to take the upside. And X2 did actually get folded. I'd already left by that point, but it was a real shame because it was a really exciting journey and a, and a great idea. It just, the timing just wasn't right, unfortunately. And you mentioned you left before they folded. Can you take me back to what happened with regards to your health at that moment? What was happening for you at that time? In Spring of 2016, I had a colonoscopy, which is where they put a camera inside you and have a look because I'd had some very severe irritable bowel syndromes, bowel issues, noticing blood. I'm very open about these things. I think it's really important for people to be, to raise awareness and, and for people to sort of be aware of these symptoms. So not something that's the most fun thing to talk about, but, but that's what was happening. And so I had this investigation and they found a tumour. It was bleeding, which was why there was blood. Luckily, it wasn't obstructing my bowel, but it was fairly large. And I had an operation to remove that and another a number of other polyps, which are small growths. And they were all tested. And it was a very scary time. I mean, I will never, ever forget that moment when I came out of that first colonoscopy and the doctor sat me down and said, I'm really sorry, but we think you've got cancer. Um, I was 31 and I was in brilliant health. I, you know, I used to run marathons. I went to the gym all the time. I thought I ate well. It was a huge shock, to be honest. But the tests all came back to show that they were precancerous, which means that there were some abnormal changes in the cell growth, but it wasn't full-blown cancer. And the doctors were very confident that just taking them out was the end. They didn't need to do anything else. Unfortunately, I, I really should have been put on a cancer pathway and they should have done more investigations. But I was just so much an exception to the rule. I was young. Bowel cancer in young people is very rare. I think it's less than 2% of people diagnosed with bowel cancer are under 40. And I was such a healthy person in so many other ways. So I don't blame anybody for missing something. It's very unfortunate, but it is what it is. What it did was made me kind of sit back and go, hang on. I need to reprioritize my life a little bit. And I asked the really big questions, you know, what do I want from life? What's making me happy? What makes me unhappy? What can I do about it? And although I absolutely loved what I'd done with X2, it was clear that things weren't going that well for the company. So I started to think about what I might want to do next. I'd also got married and we wanted to have a family. And I knew that the job I was doing, I was constantly on an aeroplane. I had to fly back from Australia after 48 hours to get to my Hindu. Um, so it was it was a full on job. And, and I knew that wasn't something that was sustainable for me for the long term. So I started thinking about what else I might want to do. And at the same time, with the health scare, I was always very interested in, in food. I'd actually already had a food blog that I used to, it was just a, a bit of a hobby, but I started looking a lot more into nutrition and into qualifications for that. And originally I just wanted to do a course that would be increase my knowledge, help me look after my myself and ensure that I looked after my bowel and my issues didn't return. But the more I looked into it, the more I kind of thought, actually, this is a really growing sector and something that I'm really interested in. I think I could make a career of it. 
So I enrolled at the College of Naturopathic Medicine, which is in central London, to study as a nutritional therapist for the next three years. And it was part time. Initially, I thought I could maybe do my job and study. And it very quickly became apparent that wasn't going to happen. And the opportunity came to walk away from X2 resources. It was a really hard decision at the time. I, I didn't want to step away from this, this thing that I'd been part of from the beginning and had you know, a, a very strong emotional attachment to. But I knew that I had to make a change and it was the right thing to do at the time. But it was quite scary. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering to what extent did the initial cancer diagnosis influence your decision to walk away from X2? Hugely, because it was the thing that made me sort of question what I wanted the longer in the longer term. And I realized that the industry I was in and the sort of role I was in wasn't what I wanted longer term. The cancer diagnosis made my husband and I sit down and go, actually, we really want a family and we want a family now. We're not that young and I need to find a job that is going to be more amenable to that and more flexible for the future. And before we talk about what happened to you last September, you mentioned family. What was happening for you during this time when you were making the shift out of X2 related to starting your own family? <laughs> so in the end, I left X2 started college and got pregnant in the space of three weeks. <laughs> so it, <laughs> right. was, it was quite a big, uh, quite a big month for me, that one. Once I kind of made the decision that I was going to start studying nutrition and, and even before like I left X2, my husband and I decided we'd start trying for a baby because it, we decided that was what was important. I hadn't worked out what I was going to do work-wise exactly, but I knew I'd signed up for this course. I knew I was going to start studying. I knew that in three years' time, I would be all being well, a qualified therapist. So so I had this sort of longer-term plan. I didn't really know what I was going to do in the interim, but I just knew that priorities were shifting and and actually, you know, getting pregnant happened fairly quickly for us, which was, which was brilliant. So it sounds like a ton happened to you in 2016. You had that initial cancer scare, which at least according to the doctors were precancerous polyps that were cleared. You left X2, you got pregnant. I know a couple years later, you got another diagnosis, which we're going to get to. But before we talk about that, what was your life like after this initial health scare and after you left the corporate world? So last September... It was when I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So just to cover those sort of two years, this was autumn 2016. I started college. I left X2. I was doing odd little bits of freelance work, but I kind of was giving myself a break as well. I was totally exhausted, to be honest. I think 10 years of city and corporate careers had really taken their toll. And, and I think, and, and also the shock and the emotional impact of the original precancerous diagnosis, even the operations aside, I think the emotional side of it hit me when I stopped. When I realized I was pregnant, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take a really extended maternity leave. I'm going to enjoy pregnancy. I'm going to enjoy studying. I'm going to have a baby. And then when the baby's born, I will then work out what I want to do getting back into work properly. So I was really lucky, very lucky, because financially I was able to do that. And I was really able to get stuck into college and, and spend time on it, which was brilliant. I was learning so much. Studying biomedicine whilst pregnant was fascinating because I was learning about what was going on in my body. And I was eating really well because I was learning a lot about what I needed to do to fuel my body properly. So that was all amazing. And then when my son was, I had a very healthy pregnancy, very healthy birth. When my son was nine months old, I started suffering from backache. So that was a year ago, beginning of 2018. And didn't think too much of it for quite a while, but it got more and more severe to the point that I was in total agony all of the time and couldn't move. Finally had an MRI and it showed that one of my vertebrae had collapsed. So it was whisked into A&E at the Royal London, where I stayed for 10 days while they did lots and lots of investigations and tried to work out what was going on and eventually discovered that it was a tumor and, and I had cancer and then all the cancer investigations started. And it was just a, I mean, last autumn was a, was a whirlwind, quite frankly, of um, hospital being in and out of hospital, lots and lots of tests, major spinal surgery, because they had to correct where my spine had collapsed. So I now have 12 metal pins in my spine 
and then radiotherapy on the spine to take the tumor down and then I started chemotherapy which I've been on ever since so yes quite a lot to deal with but I've managed to keep going with college pretty much (laughs) for the time which has been it's been good it's kept me sane in some ways (laughs) I know that there's probably no way to convey this in words or to do this justice, but can you explain what exactly ran through your head when you were definitively diagnosed with cancer? I don't know if I can. I think my head was just buzzing for about a month. I mean, it had happened in so many different parts. So I was told it was cancer after I'd had this stint in hospital and my husband immediately went into shock for me, it didn't come as an enormous surprise because of my history. I mean, it did and it didn't. You know, nobody wants to be told you've got stage four cancer, obviously, and, and it was a shock. But I think for me, there was almost relief because I've been in so much pain for so long. It kind of felt, wow, we've got an answer. We can actually start doing something about it. And I knew enough about cancer that my assumption was there's so many different ways to to treat cancer, even stage four cancer let's crack on and we we can do this. I'm healthy in so many ways. I'm going to be fine. And it was only a few weeks later that I was told, actually, this cancer is incurable. And I really started looking into the details about bowel cancer and the stats and so on. And, And I think that's when I got more of a shock and it was It was really hard. I mean, being told that, you know, you have a poor prognosis and you're terminally ill at 34 with a baby is is an impossible situation to be put in. It's really, really hard. But I'm a naturally very positive person. And I started writing about my journey. I I started a blog, which was hugely therapeutic to me, uh, helpful for a lot of my friends and family as well. But really, I started it purely to get my head around what was going on. And I feel lucky that I have a lot of knowledge about the body and you know basic medical knowledge, because that really helped me understand what was going on and be able to speak to the doctors. And whilst my prognosis hasn't changed, I am still incurable. The fact that chemo is working well so far, and I feel pretty well, you know, I don't feel terminally ill. I go out for runs. I'm studying in college. I look after my baby. It's had lasting impacts. I've lost a lot of function of my hands because of the spinal tumor. So I've had to relearn how to do certain things. I can't write physically. I can't hold a pen. So things like that have been very difficult, but I've adapted and I've learned new ways of doing things. And it's a struggle at times. Don't get me wrong. I have my moments where I break down in tears and go, it's not fair and I can't do this anymore. But most of the time I pick myself up and I go, I've got a really great life and I've got a lot going for me. And so I'm going to enjoy that. I'm going to live for today. I would imagine that wrestling with this can take you in, in one of a couple directions. One is that you, you feel enormously down and it sounds like you have had those moments. And, and the other direction is, is that it actually empowers you in some yeah. way. How have you been able to maintain such a positive outlook? Like, what do you think it is about you that allows you to feel empowered and to feel so positive in spite of the, the time you're going through right now? I think there's a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's because I've had three years to prepare myself for this. Because I had that initial diagnosis and it made me sit back and ask a lot of questions and put my life on a track that I really wanted it to be on. So, you know, the past past three years have been about me switching from a very career-driven, very busy, very stressed not unhappy, but very stressed person to someone who has pretty much everything they want in life. I mean, I really do. I have an amazing son. He's just awesome. I have a wonderful husband. We have a lovely house. I am studying, which I really enjoy. I'm on track to do a career, which I genuinely think I could do for the rest of my life. It it will be flexible. There's so many directions I could take it in. It's an area I'm fascinated in. So I am so lucky in so many ways. And I've done and achieved so much in life, which I'm very proud of. But I think it also, I'm not sitting here going, oh my God, I want to do this. I need to do that. I've never done this. But of course there's things I want to do, but I feel like I've I've done so much that I'm in a very balanced place. And, and that just really helps me enjoy every day. And cancer has just become part 
of my life. And um, at the moment, you know, I'm in a I'm in a good routine with treatment, and I know that I have four or five days a fortnight where I feel quite frankly rough, and I just have to sit on the sofa and watch Netflix. And hey, you know what? It's quite fun sometimes doing that. Right. <laughs> um, it's, it's something I wouldn't have been able to do three years ago because I would never have given myself that downtime. So I've had to learn to take things slower, which has been a real challenge for me. But on the days I feel good, then I really, you're right. I really, I feel very empowered and I really embrace them. And I'm, and I'm like, you know, I know what I want to do. And I, I only do things that I enjoy or that make me better. I don't do things that I don't want to do or that make me miserable because life, quite frankly, is too short. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was giving a talk last week, Caroline, at London Business School to some alumni about career change. And, and one of the things that someone in the audience asked me that I think I didn't have a very good answer to is how in the absence of something major like cancer or a health diagnosis or a death in your family, how do you force yourself to stop and reevaluate whether you're heading in the right direction you want to be heading in your career and your life? What thoughts do you have on how you can create some stopping power in your life to ensure you're taking the time it sounds like you've taken to recalibrate it's such a good question and you're you're absolutely right you know it's too easy to just head down plow on and, and not stop and take the time to ask those questions and i found i mean so the, my first post on my blog is is kind of my background and i i wrote down those questions that i asked myself and i kind of say to people i say to all my friends please just sit down and ask yourself kind of the big questions. What what do you want? What makes you happy? What makes you unhappy? What can you do about it? Just spend a day thinking about those. If that's all you've got, just one day thinking about those and it might change the rest of your life. And so many of my friends have said, me being ill has put things in perspective for them and they have started asking those questions. And I think that's wonderful. But it's so hard because there's always constraints. I, I was very lucky. You know, I did 10 years in well-paid jobs. So financially, I was able to take some time out to think about this. But for a lot of people, that's an enormous constraint. They can't stop. They can't just quit their job because they can't afford to. And I completely get that. And there isn't really an answer to that. But the more you can try and step back and go and take yourself on holiday or take yourself away for a long weekend, purely to think about the big things. And it doesn't mean everybody has to go and quit their career straight away. It might be much, much smaller tweaks that, they, that they you need to make. But I think you have to have a bigger picture. One thing somebody said to me when I was first diagnosed was, imagine yourself in five or 10 years time and your ideal life. And what does it look like? Where are you? What are you doing? And then think about what you can do right now to make that happen. Don't wait for five or 10 years. Start doing things now that mean that that will be a reality. That's what I started doing three years ago. So I'm already, already in a good place there. But I think, it's, I think it's really good advice, actually. What are you working towards, bigger picture? That's a good segue, Caroline, into a few of the things I was hoping we could talk about before we wrap up with what you're focused on right now with your uh, nutrition work, which are some of the things that you've learned along the way of not only your career change journey, but also your cancer journey. I know that some people who listen to this show sometimes are going through tough times, mostly related to their jobs, but also related to other aspects of their lives outside of work. In your case, you're battling cancer. You've just come out of a heart surgery. You're a relatively new mother with a toddler at home, and yet you still manage to stay productive. I'm curious what things used to consume you in your career that no longer really concern you? The little things just don't bother me anymore. I just won't get stressed about something that doesn't really matter. And I think when I was uh, in banking and then at Vicstrata and X2, you know, I could get really bogged down with the minutiae and really stressed about something which in the grand scheme of things wasn't that important. The one thing that I found made me very unhappy in work when I was kind of asking myself the big questions was politics. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, politics within work. And I was very lucky because there was very little of that in, almost none of that in X2. 
really. I think I saw a lot more of it in banking and to a certain amount in Extrata purely because it was a very big business. And when there's lots of people, you're always going to get a certain amount of it. But it's something I I couldn't stand and would upset me a lot. And I was a young woman working in a very male dominated environment my whole career. The nutrition is is quite a shock because it's almost all women. And I found that, I found that very challenging at times. It used to bother me a lot. And it's not to say that it doesn't bother me anymore, but I've just taken myself out of that picture and that's not going to be the solution for everybody. One thing that actually really helped me when I was at, I think it was at X2. Yeah, it was X2. um, I had some career coaching with a very senior female ex-lawyer actually. And she really helped me sort of see the bigger picture of some of these things and I think if you can take yourself out of the situation in some ways if there's things like that that are bothering you and talk to somebody who is outside of it I think it's it can be hugely beneficial and having gone through your career changes and now having to battle stage four cancer what's something that you've come to realize that perhaps you wish you would have realized earlier either about your career or your life I think it's just realizing what your priorities are. I don't actually think there's anything that I wish I'd realized earlier because doing the big city career was the right thing. It had its downsides. I wasn't always happy. I was often stressed. But looking back on it, I'm really proud that I did it. And I do feel like I achieved a lot. And as I say, financially, it was a big benefit. So I'm in a position now to do something that's not as financially driven. Although I wouldn't say I was ever particularly financially driven in my 20s. I now appreciate it a lot. I think it's you you reprioritize as you get a bit older. And, you know, for me, family and the people around me are the most important thing in the world. And that will be the case in my personal life and in my in my work life forever now, because I just want to surround myself by the right people because they really change how you feel and how happy you are, I think, more than anything else. Definitely. And I guess it takes me to a related question, and I'm not sure how to word this the best way, but I'd imagine that you feel the urgency and fragility of life a bit more than the average person out there, given your situation. Is there anything you feel you took for granted before that you no longer take for granted? I think we all take an awful lot for granted. I probably still take things for granted, particularly when you're young. You you just assume that you have decades ahead. You know, a lot of the time I would sort of put things off. Oh, I'll do this another time. I'll do this next year and whatever. And or on the kind of the other side of that, I would I would plan a long way ahead as well. I'd be like, well, this is going to happen in maybe six months or two years or whatever. And and I don't I don't do that anymore. The thought of planning actually terrifies me now. Whereas I've always been a an intense planner because I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, last week was such a good example because I was feeling so good and I was out for a run the day before I started feeling ill, essentially. So I had plans for the week and the weekend and then suddenly I ended up in hospital with something wrong with my heart and I didn't think I had anything wrong with my heart. So planning has become very difficult, but I actually, I struggled with that probably more than anything when I was first diagnosed. And now I embrace it because it's not to say I don't make plans. Of course I do. You know, I I plan to go out and see friends on Friday night and short-term stuff, but I'm not freaking out anymore that I don't have maybe a five or a 10 year plan. I don't, I don't feel the need so much anymore because I just try and look for right now. So when my husband and I had been planning to go to Venice forever. It's just a small example, but it's always been on our list and we'd never got around to going. So when I was diagnosed, I was like, right, we're going to Venice. And we had it booked <laughs> within weeks um, right. because, you know, it was something we wanted to do. So let's get on and do it. Let's not hang around. So think, you know, small things like that. Uh, and it doesn't mean I'm not working towards bigger things. You know, I'm still working towards my nutritional therapist qualification, which isn't going to happen because I've had to delay various bits. You know, I'm not going to be qualified for the best part of a year still. So it doesn't mean I, I give up on all plans, but I'm also not thinking, oh, well, my life's only going to start once I've qualified. There's things I can do and I'm doing already within nutrition right now, because why not? You know, now is what I've got. So let's embrace that. What have you learned about yourself in the past few months since receiving that second cancer diagnosis last year? Well, I've learned to become much more patient and I've learned that it's 
okay to let go of control a little bit. I mean, I was a total control freak and still am to some extent, but I, but I kind of can't be anymore. Something bigger has, has taken that away from me. I've learned that, you know what, it's, it's okay not to have control and the whole world won't fall apart if everything isn't being done in the way that I want it done and everything isn't in the right place. And if the washing up builds up for a bit, then, you know, it's, it's fine. The house isn't going to fall down. Uh-huh. So I think I've, I've discovered a, a slightly slower, gentler side of myself, which it's, I guess had started to appear with motherhood as well, but it's kind of a side that I'm, I'm nurturing a lot more in there. It's not to say the, um, the brisk business side of me isn't there. It still is. But, but I guess it's it's been dampened down a little bit these days. <laughs> yeah, I, so I do have a follow-up. I, I wasn't going to ask you this. I do have a follow-up question on that because I'm, I'm also somebody who is a bit of a control freak or at least <laughs> appreciates the idea of control. And I'm wondering, okay, now that you've relinquished that control a little bit, how has that gone for you? Like, Because I guess I'm always concerned that um, everything's going to fall apart. I I'm just curious how that has transpired for you once you have let go of your grip on things a little bit. I think for me, it's about working out what I can have control over and focusing on that. So partly for me, it's time frame. So I can sit down first thing in the morning and write myself a to-do list and the likelihood is I'll get it done. Or, you know, there's nothing's going to stand in the way of, of me, me getting those things done. Whereas I can't have control over what's going to happen in six months, because quite frankly, I have no idea. It's changing what you can have control on and focusing on the things that that you can control. Because we all need control in a certain sense. I'm never going to be somebody who just drifts and never makes decisions because that's not me. I like to make decisions. I like to feel that I do have an element of control, but it's learning that it's okay not to have control over everything. And it's also learning to not freak out when things don't go to plan. And actually, I've been really proud of myself, uh, how I've dealt with the past week, because the last time something sort of not not similar medically, but sort of something out, there was another spanner in the works with treatment and, and things were all changed. I lost it. I completely freaked out. And my chemo treatment was when meant to start and it had to be delayed a week for things that were outside of my control. And I couldn't cope. And it, I... I I almost had a panic attack. You know, I was so upset and I was like, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this lack of control. Whereas, you know, over the past six months, actually, I have learned that it's okay. So yes, last week messed things up and I've had to miss treatment and things have had to be rescheduled and so on, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm still here. I still feel okay. The people understand my friends, you know, my friends are all amazing. I have to cancel last minute. And and obviously nobody holds it against me because it is what it is. It's just accepting that it's okay sometimes to let go. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'd like to wrap up and not take up too much more of your time here, Caroline, with what you're doing right now. Can you tell me a little bit more about Nutritious Living and the nutrition focused cooking courses you're now planning to run? As I said, I'm still studying in college. I've nearly finished the theory side, which is very exciting, but I still have to do a certain amount of clinical practice to be a nutritional therapist. But now I have all my nutritional knowledge. I'm starting to do various things, including writing a number of books. One is already available as an ebook on my website about um, infant nutrition and cooking for families. And I'm writing a couple of others, which are you know, healthy eating focused. And they're very much work in progress. And then in the summer, once I've finished all the theory at college, I'm going to be starting some nutritional cooking courses so teaching people some very basics of nutrition as it applies in the kitchen or in the home and um, together we also will cook uh, healthy dishes so that you get a little bit of a repertoire of some some new recipes with ingredients perhaps that you wouldn't think to use straight away so they're going to be starting in the summer and I'm also going to be running one specifically for cancer patients I hope because I want to give something back to other people who are in this fairly horrible situation. Cancer is, you know, it's not nice and it's a lot to deal with. And I think nutrition is increasingly being focused on even by, you know, oncologists and, and, and other people in sort of the traditional sort of allopathic orthodox medicine. But it's still an area where a lot of people don't have that much knowledge. So the more I can spread the word on eating healthily um, and what you can perhaps do to support your body, the better. 
you can find everything about that on my website which is nutritiousliving.co.uk um, and I'm also on Instagram as nutritious.living which is where I have most of my day-to-day -day interaction. So we will definitely make sure that we include a link to your website in the show notes and I just wanted to thank you so much Caroline for taking the time to speak with me today especially because of everything that happened last week I wasn't sure if we were going to get a chance to do this when I heard that you were having heart surgery so I, I really appreciate you telling us more about your career evolution and the impact that cancer has had on your outlook on life and I just want to commend you for your positivity and bravery during this time which is really an inspiration for me and I'm sure everyone listening to this so I wish you the very best in your ongoing battle with cancer, nutritious living, and the books you're writing, along with those nutrition courses you're planning to run for other cancer patients, and I hope to cross paths with you again soon. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's been great to, great to speak to you. So I hope you gained some clarity from hearing Caroline's perspectives about the important questions in your life, where to devote your mental energies, and investing your time pursuing a career you truly care about. Now it's time to wrap up with today's mental fuel, where I'm going to share what I'm trying to do myself to create my ideal future. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge to help you move forward with your own career goals. For today's Mental Fuel, I want to pick up on one of the things Caroline said that really struck a chord with me. She said that you should think about what you want your ideal life to look like in five or 10 years, then to take steps right now to make that happen. And that got me thinking about my own life and my own career and the steps I'm at least trying to take to make those things come true. And I wanted to share this with you, which I hope can be a useful point of reference and hopefully encourage you to do the exercise yourself. So for me, I'm going to focus on the five-year time horizon because I just find that projecting any further into the future is tough to do with any degree of precision. And I guess for the purposes of today, I'll talk about three of the most important domains of my life, which are my health, my family, and my work. So I have to start with health, which is actually one of the things on my mind a lot these days. This conversation with Caroline definitely brings it to the forefront for me and hopefully for you. But also, I'm in my 40s now, and I do feel like stuff starts to come up with your health during this particular decade of life. And if I think five years ahead, I'd ideally like to be feeling healthy and energetic every single day, hopefully with no major health issues, knock on wood. And although I know that some things are just completely outside of your control when it comes to your health, I really am trying to make a point to do two things right now, which are to make sure I devote at least 30 minutes every other day to some sort of high intensity exercise, most often swimming. I know that's not a ton, but it's what I can reasonably do right now with everything I have going on in my life. I'm also really trying my hardest to just go to bed earlier and grant my body enough time to rest overnight, which is a major shift from my old habit of staying up really late. With family, I hope in five years that I continue to have a strong relationship with my wife, one that's full of love, mutual support, and a lot of care. I actually feel like I need to make more of an effort to carve time out away from our daughter to just spend more one-on-one -on -one time with her, which is something we're trying to do more of these days. I'm also hoping to have more time with my mother, who lives very far away right now in the United States. So I'm in the process of working with some immigration advisors to figure out what steps, if any, we can take to allow her to spend more time in the UK, especially as she gets older. Finally, I hope to have a really strong connection and mutual trust with my daughter, Juliet, who will be seven in five years. So right now, I dedicate one full day during my work week to spending time with her, along with the weekends, and I'm just doing everything I can to be as present in her life as possible building my business in a way that gives me the maximum flexibility so that I can spend the most time possible with her. We also recently moved earlier this month to a more family-friendly location near London, which we hope can serve as a solid, positive environment for her and really all of us. Finally, with my work, 
in five years, I'd like to be devoting even more of my time to doing public speaking and workshops so that I can have an impact on the lives of even more people considering career transitions, ideally in locations that go beyond the four countries where I host most of my workshops now, which are the UK, US, Spain, and France. But in order to do this, I've got to more proactively pitch myself for speaking opportunities, something I've not done a lot of to date but also let go of some other things I dedicate time to on this business, including this podcast, which I've enjoyed doing so much, but have recently decided to bring to a close later this year, at least for now, which has been a really tough decision for me because I enjoy doing this podcast, but a decision I've been thinking about making for a while and feel will be the best for my career, family, health, and life. More on this in a future episode. So those are just three domains of my life. I haven't talked about things like friendships or other family relationships, personal growth, money, or other aspects of my life, but hopefully this gives you a sense of where I'm hoping my life will be in five years and the steps I'm at least trying to take to make it a reality, especially because I know that life can be so temperamental and fragile. And I really hope that this episode has been a reminder of how fragile your life is and how everything you have right now can change when you least expect it. So it's really up to you to figure out how much you're willing to delay taking the actions you feel will improve your career or family life or health or whatever is most important to you right now. My hope is that you'll choose to take action now because you really just never know when your life can be upended by something that may have never even crossed your mind. This brings me to one of my favorite quotes from the late Steve Jobs that really helped me when I was at a turning point in my career when I was working in the corporate world, deciding whether to move on from a job that wasn't fulfilling me anymore. And he said, remembering that I'll be dead soon is one of the most important tools I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Almost everything, all expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. So my challenge to you is to do what Caroline recommended and find a quiet moment to sit down and write down exactly what you want your life to look like in the future. You can probably do this pretty quickly if you just jotted down a bullet or two about each important domain in your life, or you could take it a step further and even write a letter to your future self about where you hope you'll be and who you hope you'll be in the future. Most importantly, after you've done this, decide what specific actions you're going to take right now to maximize the chances of making this vision come true. Because while there are no guarantees things will turn out exactly as you hope, you might as well do everything you can to try and turn your hopes into reality. If you want to share the choice you've committed to making with me or the listener community, or you just want to share one of the hopes you have for your life or your career, I'd welcome you leaving me a voicemail at careerrelaunch.net slash 62, where you can also find a summary of all the key concepts from today's conversation with Caroline. Again, that's careerrelaunch.net slash 62. In our next episode of Career Relaunch, we're heading over to Grayling, Michigan, where I'll be speaking with a marketer who left Google to join the nonprofit world. We're going to talk about the career trade-offs you make to enable the lifestyle you want and what it's really like to take a pay cut in your career. Thanks so much for listening to Career Relaunch and a very special thank you today to Caroline Yates for sharing her brave, inspiring story with us today from London. I hope you'll join me in keeping Caroline in your thoughts as she continues her battle with cancer. This episode was mixed by Richard Pennington. Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu, and I'll see you next time.